morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study. Thank you so very much for joining us. We are currently in a study series working through the Pentateuch according to the annual cycle of readings, and today's portion, today's Parsha, is called Vayigash, Vayigash, and it's translated variously and he drew near, and he approached, and he came up. Uh, the idea, as we will see, it's about Judah and this dramatic scene that is set before our eyes in the book of Genesis chapter 44. So the reading, Vayigash, comes to us from Genesis. It goes from Genesis 44, verse 18, and runs all the way to chapter 47, Verse 29, Genesis 44, 18 through 47, 29. The prophet reading that is associated with this particular Pentateuch reading, according to the annual cycle, is Genesis chapter 37, verse 15 through 28. Now, I think most of you, many of you who've been with me for quite some time, know that this is one of my all-time favorite readings from the Pentateuch, from the book of Genesis in particular. It's a fantastic story. I love it. I love the implications of it. I love what it points to. And so I'm excited about today's class, and I hope that you are as well. Um, our current study, this is number 12, number 12 in our series, The Pentateuch, A New Look. So what we're doing is we're working through, and this is class number 12, but in addition to that, there's another division that we are presently find ourselves in. We are in the 10th of 10, let's call them books within the book. So within Genesis, there are 10 sections that were what we believe that were put together by an ancient scribe, an editor, a redactor, a final compiler of these fascinating stories, put these together and broke them into 10 sections. Each of these sections begins, Ele Toledot, these are the bringings forth, typically translated, these are the generations. This is 10 of 10. Of 10. It began all the way back in Genesis 37, and this particular reading, the 10th, Eli Toledot Yaakov began in Genesis 37 and runs all the way to the end of the book of Genesis at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 26. Now, the focus of Eli Toledot Yaakov or Eli Toledot Jacob is not Jacob, it's Joseph. Now, Jacob plays into the story, but Joseph is the real focus. We are presently in our third week, then, of the Joseph saga. Now, the, I'm calling the, the Ele Toledot Yaakov, I call it the Joseph saga. So we're in class number three of the Joseph saga. Now, open your Bibles with me this morning. Let's jump right in. Uh, and I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 42. I just told you that we begin our reading today in 4418, but I want to begin with Genesis 42 and verse 34, 4234. It says, And bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you, your brother, and you shall traffic in the land. Now, that's the ASV. Now, you'll recall that this particular story, um, let me just translate that a little more uh, closely to the Hebrew. And ye shall bring your brother, I'm using ye for the plural aspect of it, ye shall bring your brother, the small one or the young, to me. And I will know that ye, plural, are not spies, but right, honest men are ye. And your brother I will give to you in the land ye shall trade in. And by the way, that's another interesting subject I've been digging into. won't go into it today. 
but there are a couple of passages where the Israelites are associated with what I just translated as trade, but that's another class. So this, if you recall, the context of what I just read in Genesis chapter 42 is Joseph is speaking. He's accused uh, these brothers of being spies, and he sets up this thing where he says, you know, you're spies. They say, no, we're not. He said, look, go get that younger brother that you keep telling me about and bring him here. And when you bring him here, I will, translations vary, but literally what it says, I'll give to you your brother. These are the words of Joseph, the man, the Lord of the land. Now, the context of this, this is the, the version of the words of the Lord of the land from the brothers when they go back to Jacob. And they returned to the land of Canaan from Egypt. But guess what? They no longer have Simeon with them. So now Joseph, uh, now Jacob has lost Joseph. His sons have now caused him to lose Simeon for all he knows. And they've come back and they've said, we want the next one. Give us son number three. Now, on the surface, the words of Joseph, when he says, uh, I'll know that you're not spies when you bring the little one, your youngest brother, to me. On the surface, when he says he'll, he'll give them their brother, you would read that the first way, and, and you would say that it means he's going to give them Simeon. I mean, that's the most natural way to read that, isn't it? He's got Simeon. You go, uh, I'll pr you'll prove your point that you're not spies and that you're truthful men when you bring this young one back that you've talked about. And when you do that, I'll give you your brother. So again, the most natural one to think that he's talking about is Simeon, which is perfect in the story because it's a swap, if you will. It's a swap. Uh, I'll give you the second son of Leah for the second son of Rachel. That's an even swap, okay? Now, he doesn't know, supposedly, this man, the Lord of the land, doesn't know anything about the boys other than what they have told him. Now, Simeon is, in fact, released later in this particular story. In chapter 43, verse 23, we read that Simeon is released to him. So if that's what this is, that's what the, the man of the land meant by his words, then there we have it. You bring back the youngest one, which they did. I'll, re, I'll give you your brother. And if he meant Simeon, then that's what he did. And everything is fine. But listen, this story and the writer thereof is far too good to give it to us that easily. In other words, the story is more complex than that. I think that the story is way too complex for such a simple, easy solution that I just presented, and I'm going to show that today. The scribe, in this particular story, Ele Toledot Yaakov, has a twist in the plot. His words have a double meaning. When he says that he'll give them their brother, yes, on the surface, it looks like he's talking about Simeon, but I think he means something else as well, a double meaning. Yosef, known as the man, the Lord of the land, has a silver goblet. When he turns them loose to go home, he puts the goblet in. I'm going to run through a few of the details of the story, which you all know, to set the stage for today's class. He puts the goblet in Benjamin's sack. The boys are pursued and overtaken on their way back to Canaan. Go with me to chapter 44, Genesis 44, and verse 11. They hasted and took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack, and he searched 
and began at the eldest and left off at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Now the brothers, um, this is me, not the translation, then they, the brothers, rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. Now you can imagine what's going on in their mind right now. The cup is found in Benjamin's sack. Now look down at verse 14. Genesis 44, 14. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, and he was not yet there. And they fell before, I'm sorry, and he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Know ye not that such a man as I indeed divine? And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are in my Lord's, we are my Lord's bondmen, both we and he also, in whose hand the cup is found. So Judah offers the whole lot of them up as slaves. And we're going to see why he does that. But his initial response is, he, he's thinking. I, I want to try to imagine what's going on in his head. He's thinking, here I am before the Lord of the land of Egypt. We're caught. The cup that belongs to the man of the land, the Lord of the land, is in our baby brother's bag. We have got to offer all ourselves up. It's the only way. Because he, what can he say? He said, what can I say to clear us of this? You, sure enough, they opened the sack. Now, remember, right before that, there was this dramatic scene played out. It reminds us when Laban is looking for his idols. I brought this up last week. And the response is, whoever you think, we didn't steal it. Whoever's bag you find it in, let him die. Well, what you going to do now? It's a plot. All right, so the set, this story sets up the reader for one of the most dramatic scenes, one of the most dramatic, gripping stories in the entirety of the Bible. It is now, ladies and gentlemen, a time of reckoning and a time of revelation. Now look at chapter 44, verse 18. This is where our class begins today. And in chapter 44, verse 18, it says, Vayigash elav Yehuda, and Judah drew near, or Judah approached. The phrase, Vayigash, and he drew near. This precise form, Vayigash, occurs 26 times in the Tanakh. And it means basically that. If I... If I'm back here and I move to here, I just drew near to the table. It literally means to close that distance is what it's talking about. And it can be used in a variety of ways. Now, there is a similar story, a story, one of the occurrences of this word reminds me of this story, and it also comes from Genesis. By the way, the Vayigash in this precise form occurs seven times in Genesis. Uh, I want you to look with me at the other occurrence of Vayigash that plays into today's story. Go with me to Genesis chapter 18, Genesis 18 and verse 23. And Abraham drew near. Vayigash Avraham, Vayomer. All right, so it's, and then he spoke. So this story in Genesis uh, 18, 23, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou consume the righteous with the wicked? So if you remember the story, what's going on in Genesis 18 is that Abraham is appealing to God about the outcome, what's to come of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what he's trying to do is he draws near he says, you know, don't be angry with me. He says that two, two times, 18, chapter 18, verse 30, chapter 18, verse 32. 
He draws near and he's making an appeal for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Will you destroy everyone? What if there's some righteous? Will not the judge of all the earth do justly is the way he puts it to God. But his whole purpose in drawing near to God is to move God from judgment to mercy. Now that reminds me of what's going on. It's the image that I have in my mind of what's going on as Judah draws near to, we don't know it's Joseph yet, so let's call him the man of the land, the Lord of the land. The Hebrew Bible calls, calls him Haish, the man, comma, Lord of the land. So he draws near to the man, Lord of the land, and he's hoping, he's hoping to move that Lord of the land from judgment to mercy. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. You have a room full of the, the sons of Israel. The known ones are identified, the ones that are recognized as the sons of Israel, and the one who's not recognized, who appears to be an Egyptian lord of the land. And, and these boys, these men, are um, they're actually suspected of a crime against the high official in Egypt. So think about that. And in this room where we, we would presumably have Yosef, the man of the land, sitting up, at least this is the way my favorite artist Tissot draws it, and, and the boys, here comes Judah. He's walking up. Now, in my mind, I imagine a few spears are turned towards him because he's approaching. What are you doing? He, he has the courage to approach and listen to what he says. He says, please let your servant speak a word in your ear. Now, this is bold. So I don't want you to lose this. The author wants you to understand how courageous this is or crazy, you might say. Now, Judah, here's what he's at. A, he's a man with no other option. He knows for a fact he cannot go back to his father without Benjamin. He's, he's putting it all on the table here. There is no way that he's going to do that. And here, now he tells the Lord of the land, I want to whisper something in your ear. Please. He uses the, the Hebrew word, nah. Please let me speak a word in your ear. Here's what he whispers. Look at verse 19, chapter 44, verse 19. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead. I want you to remember that. And he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And you said unto your servants, Bring him down unto me that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. And you said unto your servants, Except your youngest brother come down unto you with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, he's telling Joseph this, when we came unto, unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again, buy us a little food. And we said, we can't go down. If our youngest brother isn't with us, then if he is with us, then we'll go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, ye know that my wife bare me two sons. The one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I've not seen him since. And if you take this one also from me, and harm befall him, you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now therefore, when I came to thy servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will come to pass when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to Sheol. 
for your servant became surety or a pledge for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then shall I bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore let thy servant, I pray thee, abide instead of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go to my father if the lad be not with me, lest I see the evil that shall come on my father? Now he whispers this in Joseph's ear. It's an emotional plea. He recounts to Joseph the part of the story that Joseph knows, but he's also, he's also giving a side of the story that Joseph has no way to know unless he be told. Can you imagine being in Joseph's chair at this moment? He knows that Judah, who's speaking with him, the one who drew near, he knows this is his brother, and he knows that Judah does not recognize him. He now learns from Judah part of the story that he didn't know. What happened after the boys put him in the pit? He's learning for the first time that he is believed to be dead, verse 20. Judah tells him, look, the, about this boy, Benjamin, he's got a brother who went out and he's dead. In verse 22, he reminds Joseph that losing Benjamin would kill his father. He says, if I go back without Benjamin, without the young one, my father will die. And then in verse 27 through 29, this is what really um, I think it, it begins to, to touch Joseph in a way that leads to his un losing control. He, for the first time, Joseph, for the first time, hears through Judah his father's words about losing Joseph. He hears his father's voice through Judah about the agony of losing Joseph, and he now knows for the first time that his dad, that Jacob believes that Joseph was torn to pieces by a wild beast. He also hears that his father says, if any harm comes to this one, his brother, then I'll die. In verse 32, Judah tells Joseph that he, that Judah is a pledge for the safety of Benjamin. Now, that, that word in Hebrew, ein resh bet, I want you to see where else that word, a pledge, is used with Judah. Go with me to Genesis 43, um, 43, 9. We're going to work our way back. This is where he, he says, uh, he tells Jacob, I will be surety for him. I'll be a pledge for him. Of my hand shall you require him if I bring him not unto you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever. So he tells Jacob, I'm the pledge. Me. If I don't bring him back, you blame me forever. Now remember, I taught this last week, um, and many of you probably recognize this, only Judah can have that connection with his dad because he's lost too. Now, this isn't the first time that our author craftily puts the word pledge with Judah. It's not like pledge is used all the time. Do a search on it. Judah is associated with this idea of a surety, a pledge. And some of you may recognize where I'm going with this because the writer did not want us to miss this key component to the narrative. We, it, it was placed into the writing by the final redactor, the editor, the author, uh, in such a way that we would need to, to get this piece of information. So just as, let me tell you about the pledge and Judah. Just as Judah gives himself as a pledge to convince his father to, uh, to allow the uh, this, this whole thing to transpire, he, the father doesn't want to lose, Judah doesn't want to lose a third son either. 
Does that make sense? So Judah gave a pledge to avoid the same thing. All right, look with me at Genesis 38. Genesis 38 and verse 17. And he said, I will send thee a kid of the goats from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge? She's talking to Judah, remember, till you send it. And he said, what pledge shall I give? And she said, your signet, your cord, your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So just as Judah gives himself as a pledge to his father, he does this to convince his father to allow the possibility of losing that third son. In other words, you've got to give him up, Dad. I'll be the pledge. Judah also gave a pledge to avoid losing his third son. In that case, he gave up his signet and his staff and so forth. Now, go back with me to Genesis 44. Genesis 44, back in our story, verse 33. Now, therefore, this is Judah to Joseph, the end of his speech. Let your servant, I pray you, abide instead of the lad, a bondman, a servant, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad be not with me, lest I see the evil that shall come on my father? Now, if you recall, back in Genesis 37, verse 26 and 27, Judah's previous plan is what ultimately put Joseph into slavery, but also led to his current place. It was Judah's plan. Some wanted to kill the lad, and Judah said, don't, let's sell him off. Now things have come full circle. This plan proposes that Judah now place himself into servanthood. Judah's learned a very valuable lesson through very painful experiences. And now he's seeking to make it right. Now, all of this is overwhelming, as you can imagine. When we read this story, imagine yourself in that room. Now, Genesis 44, Judah goes forward. He draws near. He whispers this into the ear of Joseph, the man of the land, the Lord of the land. And everything is overwhelming. The emotion is too much. As I said, Joseph now learns that he's thought of as dead. His father thinks he's dead. His brothers think he's dead. And Joseph can't control himself. So he clears the room. He, he, tells them, he tells his servants that are standing by, get everybody out. Now he and his brothers are all alone. Look at 45, verse 1, Genesis 45, 1. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood before him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. Go back with me to Genesis 42. Verse 34, and bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that you're not spies, but that you're true men, and so I will give you your brother, and I will give you your brother. This, my friends, is what he meant. It's at least a double meaning. When they brought Benjamin, he did indeed give up Simeon. But it's now, 
now that he knows that they are true men, only now does he really get that. Only now is he attached to Judah in such a way he knows that it is time to reveal himself. So when he says, I will give to you your brothers, your brother, that's exactly what he does at this point. He gives them their brother, and that brother is him. Look at verse 3, chapter 45, Genesis 45, verse 3. And Joseph, well, let me look, let's go back to 2. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brother, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. Now, even when I read that, I get chills. Can you imagine, through tears, he's shaking, and he says, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. You know what the next thing he says? Doth my father yet live? Is my father still alive? Ha'od avikai. Ani Yosef. Ha'od avikai. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Now, I think that came out like this. Can you imagine? That's a lot to take in for the boys Israel. They, they hear this person's voice, no doubt shifting into Hebrew. Up until this point, he's had interpreters and so forth. But he said just what I said. Ani Yosef, ha'od avichai. I think they're taken back. You know what? It says they were unable to respond. They can't answer, which reminds me of Genesis 37, verse 4, when they hated him so much, it said, that they couldn't answer him peacefully. They couldn't say a word to him before because they hated him so much. Now they've got their speech, the faculty of speech is gone because they're literally rocked back on their heels. Now, this is an important point, and I think one of the most important points uh, in this Torah reading, and it's one that the author doesn't want us to miss. You cannot miss this. If you read it in English or in Hebrew or I suppose in any language, the one word that's going to show up over and over and over again in this story, by the way, this is the longest narration, the longest spoken part in uh, the book of Genesis is this dialogue between Joseph and Judah. And what, what we see that comes up from both is father. The word father occurs 14 times because it, the author wants you to see that Judah's main concern is not for himself. And you know what? And get this, it's not even for Benjamin. It's for the father. See, his point is, don't let Benjamin, don't keep Benjamin as your servant. Keep me as your servant. Why does he say that? Because he loves Benjamin so much? I'm sure he may have loved Benjamin. But that's not why he says he wants to do that. He said, listen, you don't understand here, Lord of the land. If I go back to my father without this boy, without the young one, my father will die, and I can't do that. You see, I pledged myself to my father, and I will not. Let harm come to him. He's got to go. You have to keep me. See, he's concerned with the father. Over and over, he said, my father has this, this he's, one of his sons is dead. He's got this other one. 
My father, my father, my father. Joseph, when he says, Ani Yosef, Haod Avichai, the first thing he wants to know is, you need to understand, I'm Joseph, is my father okay? So what do we have here? We have Judah and Joseph are both driven into action. They're both driven to do things that they wouldn't do because of their love and concern for one person. Both of them are concerned for the same person. Both of them have placed their father above everything else. Judah drew near. Judah drew near. Vayigash. And now Joseph says, uh, let's look at verse 4, 45, 4. And, and um, let's read the rest of 3. And Joseph said unto his brother, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. All right. Just as Judah drew near, here in verse 4, that same Hebrew word is used twice. They, he, Judah drew near, and then Joseph tells the other brothers, uh, draw near, come closer, and they do. So, vayigash, and then this different forms of the same word to show that the whole point of this meeting is a drawing near of the sons of Israel together. That's what the scribe wants us to see. It is a closeness that hasn't been until now. Now, look at verse 5. And now be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Notice he, he says, don't be hard on yourselves. You did sell me here, by the way. Don't ever forget that. But this is important. This is what Joseph has his insight is. God did send me before you to preserve life. Look at verse 6. For these two years has the famine been in the land, and there are yet five years in which there shall be neither plowing nor harvest. Verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the land and to save you alive by great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he's made me a father to Pharaoh. By the way, that phrase is found in Egyptian writings of the ancient world. So we know that this is sort of a position as a, an advisor, very interesting study. It's outside the scope of our class today. Um, uh, God sent me before you uh, and has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, hurry up, and go to my father and say unto him, thus says your son Joseph. This is what he wants him to say. Quote me on this. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Now, can you imagine? This is powerful. Joseph wants the boys to understand, the brothers to understand, you, off the top, you're the one that put me here, but really, 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 it was God who did it. God put me in this position. Now go tell my dad that I'm the Lord over all Egypt. So Joseph lays out the plan, and, uh, you know, the plan involves they're going to be in the choicest of territory. They're going to live in Goshen, uh, and then he gives them provisions. <clears throat> and you wouldn't, this wouldn't be a Joseph story if it didn't have one element that all of them have. You know what it is? Look at verse 22. 
45, 22. To all of them, he gave each man changes of clothing. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. So remember when we started the Joseph saga, one thing that you have to have as you're writing the story, it's garments, it's clothing. So the story begins with Joseph has this beautiful garment. Now he gives to all of the boys probably very nice clothing, especially Benjamin who gets five. Because now this is almost comical in a way. The whole thing about them hating Joseph started with his beautiful garment. Now he says, in, I think he says to himself, I think he does, uh, he sees remorse and repentance on the part of the brothers over hating a son of Rachel for having nice clothes, so he's going to test it one more time. So he gives Benjamin five nice garments. Now, if Benjamin knows the story of what happened to Joseph, he might be like, oh, I don't want the nice clothes. Give them to someone else. Now look at verse 25, 45, 25. They went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Verse 26, the boys tell daddy, O Joseph, hi. I want you to imagine they're running towards their dad. The wagons are coming, and, and uh, old Jacob's watching. And the boy, I'm thinking it's Judah, gets there first. Oh, he's out of breath. Oh, Joseph, hi. Oh, Joseph, hi. Joseph still lives. And Jacob just, can you imagine? In verse 28, after he believes them, he says, J Jacob says, O Yosef benichai, still Yosef, my son, lives. Now, this sets us up for the meeting of the whole family, the reunion of Israel. In chapter 46, we have a shift. It's, it's, the only, it's the only occurrence of this sort of thing in Ele Toledot Yaakov. If you remember, I told you that one thing that happens once you get to Genesis 37 is you do encounter God through dreams and visions, but one thing that seems to be lacking for the most part is a uh, God came unto so-and-so. Well, here we have the only occurrence of that in the Eli Toledot Yaakov. And here's what it is. It says in verse uh, 2, now they're at Beersheba. It says Israel, verse 1, took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the Elohim of his fathers, uh, uh, his father Isaac. And Elohim spake unto Israel in the visions of the night. Now see, it's still a vision, but it reminds us of what we found in Genesis 28, um, where Jacob is leaving to go to Padan Aram. But it says, uh, God spake unto him, Israel in the visions of the night and said, Yaakov, Yaakov. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God. Uh, and if you look at verse 3, uh, he says, I am Anochi Ha'el Elohei Avicha. I am 
the El, Elohe of your fathers. It's interesting that he uses this form of the name and not Jehovah. Remember, if you look back, uh, we know that that comes in later. So, I am God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hands upon your eyes. By the way, in this passage, God speaks to Jacob, calls his name twice, Yaakov, Yaakov. There are only three occurrences of God calling the name twice for what it's worth. You have this, uh, you have a passage in 2211, Avraham, Avraham, God calls to Abraham. Uh, then you have Jacob, Jacob here. And then in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, Moshe, Moshe, God calls Moses. Now, the rest of chapter 46 of Genesis is defining who the Israel uh, family is, the clan, basically. These are the sons of Jacob that went down to Israel. And, of course, we all came to know that that number of 70 plays in. I'm not going to get into that, the, the back and forth between how do you get 70, and uh, there's quite an extensive bit of debate on that. But if you want some fun, you can go in and count the names and figure out, you know, is there really 70 or is there, you know, whatever. Okay. Now, in chapter 46, leading into 47, what we get is the reunion of the whole family. And it reminds me, again, because our scribe is brilliant at this, it reminds me very similar story to when Jacob and Esau meet. Remember, they run to each other and they fall upon each other's neck and they weep. Very similar. The separated father, in this case, uh, and son, in, in chapter 47, they embrace uh, or at the end of chapter 46 when they see each other for the first time. Uh, in fact, let's look at um, verse 29 of chapter 46. Joseph made ready his chariot, went up to meet his father to Goshen. He presented himself unto him, fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die. Since I have seen your face, that you are yet alive. Now, remember the story about Jacob and Esau. And I've, now that I've seen your face, remember it's all about Peniel. And so the stories are similar. Now, when you get into chapter 47, Joseph prepares his family for this meeting with Pharaoh. I'm not going to take this verse by verse, but uh, verse 2 is uh, he selects five of the brothers to appear before Pharaoh. He doesn't send them all. Why didn't he send them all? We're not told. We're not even told which five are to present themselves before Pharaoh, but he carefully selects them. He tells them, when you go before Pharaoh, you need to tell them this, uh, but don't say anything about the shepherd thing, remember? And then the first thing the boys do is, what do you guys do? Well, we're shepherds. We've been shepherds. Our fathers were shepherds. There is a... Uh, a little link in here, a little code that says uh, that the shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. What does that mean? Why are shepherds an abomination to Egyptians? Shepherd, they have flocks, they have livestock, so what's the big deal? Well, there's a debate on that, but I will tell you that many of you know of the famous Hyksos, and uh, this group called the Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, uh, do a study, wonderful study. Don't have time for it today, but the Hyksos, roughly 1680 to 1540 BCE. Um, that's for another class. But they were shepherds, and uh, that's all I'll say about that. They, they were not very uh, loved 
let's just put it that way, when it was all over. Verse 7 of chapter 47, 47, 7. Uh, and Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage, or my sojourning, are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. So he's 130 at this meeting. And we know that he lives to be 147. He's got 17 years of his life left. He defines his life. The days of the years of my life are few and bad ones. And he said, I'm not as, I hadn't lived as long as my fathers did. Now, an interesting, some of you people are math people. I'm not really a big fan of math. I'm not that good at math. Uh, so I saw this in one of my research papers uh, that I was using to prepare for this class, and it says this. So write this down, all you math people. Abraham lives to be 175, which is 7 times 5 squared. This is not my typical stuff. I just thought somebody might like it. Isaac lives to be 180, which is 5 times 6 squared. And Jacob lives to be 147, which is 3 times 7 squared. So the father's ages, uh, there's a correlation there. Why anybody would care about that, I don't know. But someone did, and I thought you might like that. Additionally, it says that Jacob lives 147, to be 147. Now, what's, what's, he's 130 when he arrives in Egypt, He's going to spend the final 17 years of his life with Joseph. And the reason that that's important, because it shows that our author is interested in such symmetry, because when we began the story, Ele Toledot Yaakov, we meet Joseph in this story, he's 17. So when he's kidnapped, when he's sold into slavery, he's 17, and his father doesn't see him after that until the last 17 years of Jacob's life. Now, there's an often missed part of Joseph, Joseph's plan. A lot of people don't really recognize this. When you read chapter 47, verse 13 through 27, it describes how bad things got in Egypt, really around the world, in those last five years. The Egyptians uh, ultimately sold themselves into slavery to Pharaoh to survive. Hmm. We don't think of the Egyptians as being in slavery. They're the enslavers, but a Hebrew with a great plan, plan from God, ultimately brought Egypt into slavery. Now, some people might not like the way I put that, but you have to hear it like that because the author wants you to see it, but you might not have noticed before. You might not have thought about that. But they absolutely, they're indentured servants. Look, we don't have anything else to give. We've given everything. I tell you what we'll do. We'll continue to be enslaved. It's all we've got to give. Je Joseph says, there you go. Thank you very much. And so our story for the week ends here but I'm not finished. The Haftarah um, is a section of, prof of the prophets. 
which is attached to the Pentateuch reading, and it's believed, because people debate where this began, but it's believed to go back to a time, at least one theory, is that when Antiochus forbade the reading of the Torah, that the Jews began to use another section of Scripture, which wasn't forbidden, evidently, and they would often try to find a similar passage or something that in their mind tied to the reading that they were supposed to be reading. Eh, whether that's true, we don't know. Now, the most ancient method of reading through the five books is through what's called the triennial Sec, uh, the triennial method of reading, where it takes three, three and a half years to work through the five books. And we know <clears throat> that they did this, Shabbat after Shabbat. We even have the readings. The oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Leningrad Codex, it's called B19, uh, has all of the, the Sidra, the, all of the different breakdowns of the text. And, and so we also have list of the prophet sections that they read with them. So when it's, when this meeting, <clears throat> when Judah draws near to Joseph in the ancient cycle of readings, uh, I'm going to read you the prophet section that is for Vayigash. You ready? You're thinking Ezekiel 37. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. That's the annual cycle. Go with me. This is the ancient triennial reading that's tied to Vayigash, the bringing together of Judah and Joseph. Zechariah chapter 10, beginning in verse 3. <clears throat> Mine anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the he goats, for Jehovah of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as goodly horse in the battle. From him shall come forth the cornerstone, from him the nail, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. And they shall be as mighty men treading down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because Jehovah is with them and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph and I will bring them back for I have mercy on them and they shall be as though I had not cast them off for I am Jehovah their God and I will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man their hearts shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and rejoice. Their hearts shall be glad in Jehovah. And I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall remember me in far countries. And they shall live with their children and shall return. And I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. And it goes on. This particular prophetic passage, let me go two more. He will pass through the sea of affliction and will smite the waves in the sea and all the depths of the Nile shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. And I will strengthen them in Jehovah, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith Jehovah. This particular, this particular passage has to do with bringing Judah and Joseph out of the dispersion, out of exile. And it mentions... The two big ones, Egypt and Assyria. In other words, everywhere that my people might have left some. Now, interestingly enough, and I'm not going to do this all today, but Isaiah 11 also mentions these 
Uh, he'll reach his hand again a second time to gather the exiles, ones that are in Egypt and Assyria and so forth. <clears throat> The annual cycle of readings, the prophet reading is from Ezekiel 37, verse 15 through 28. Go with me there. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, verse 15. The word of Jehovah came again unto me, saying, for thou, son of man, take thee a stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companion. And join them for thee to one, uh, to another into one stick that they become one in your hand. When the children of your people shall speak unto thee, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by thee? Say unto them, Thus says Jehovah, the Lord, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest, shall be in your hand before their eyes, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whether they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their land, their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be the king unto them all. They shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all." Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in mine ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, they, their children, their children's children forever. And David my servant shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations shall know that I am Jehovah, that sanctifies Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, I happen to have, most of you know this, this beautiful handmade stick and I don't know that Ezekiel's was this beautiful. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was. But you'll notice that on these, uh, it's written, just as this prophecy says, to Judah and the sons of Israel, his companions. You can see the Hebrew writing there, maybe. And this one says to Joseph, stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions, and the, the charge was to take these two and put them together just like this. Notice I'm twisting them together, putting one upon the other, and they will become one in the hand. Now, what this indicates, this prophecy indicates, is that the children of Israel would be divided. You would have the house of Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and the house of Judah. And they would be separate until the right time, upon which they would be combined. And so this symbolizes the two houses. And where it talks about make them one in your hand, the prophecy is interpreted to mean that the hand represents the land. So the two will become one in the land. Now, the rabbis and those who assigned the readings 
of the prophet section to the Pentateuch readings, what are they trying to say to us? They're making a clear connection between Judah and Joseph coming together again in Ezekiel 37 with the story of Ju Ju uh, Judah drawing near to Joseph. And by the way, this subject of the reunion of Judah and Joseph is the dominant theme in all the prophets. Dozens of sections of text deal with this reunion. So, is the writer in Genesis aware that this has later prophetic implications? Who knows? It certainly connects in a lot of ways, and we'll, we'll look at a few of them. Let me just give you a few points, uh, some observations. Joseph is separated from his family. For all intents and purposes, he becomes a foreigner. He becomes an Egyptian. He dresses like an Egyptian. He speaks like an Egyptian. I mean, he's there for 20 years. They think he's dead. He's unrecognized by his family. We learn that God was behind this plan to separate Joseph from his family all alone. God was the one that was behind it. This was from God. And let, let me tell you this, so was the separation between uh, the northern and southern kingdoms. That too is from God. It's all part of the plan. Like you might say, well, why would God be behind the bad things that happened to Joseph. Huh? We can't read the story and not come to that conclusion. Joseph says, God did this. But ultimately, he realized that God put me in this place and I am now in a position to bring life. It was a long 20 years probably. But it brought life. When the northern and southern kingdoms separate, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 15, verse 24, 2 uh, uh, Chronicles chapter 11, verse 4, all say, God says, this thing, this separation of the tribes, is from me. Why? It ultimately brings life. It, br it brings a reunion and it brings life. So the first thing is Joseph is separated from his family. The tribes of Joseph are separated from the family. Joseph is unrecognized by the family. This northern group in the latter days will not be recognized. They'll come to a knowledge that that's who they are. They won't be admitted by the group uh, of known sons of Israel. Those who know that they know and everyone knows, they're not going to recognize the Joseph tribes. It doesn't fit the, the, the story. Now, get this. Judah <clears throat> is trusted. He's not perfect. No one says he's perfect. But Judah is trusted. Judah is going to be instrumental in bringing about the latter-day reunion. I promise you, watch. Judah has pledged himself to the Father. These are my thoughts. These are my observations. A lot of people want to be critical of Judah, uh, very critical and point the finger. You know, uh, a lot of people say, I'm Joseph. I believe I'm Joseph, and I wish they would just recognize me. Well, read your Bible. They're not going to recognize you, not yet. So just relax. And, and a lot of people want to point at Judah and say, well, look at all the problems Judah has. That's not part of the story. It's not part of the script. Stop doing that. Okay? Judah has pledged himself to God in the story in Genesis as well as later on. Again, not perfect, but the father 
is going to trust Judah. Mark it down. A famine. A famine drives the events that lead to the reunion. A famine. It has to. I mean, that's the whole story of Judah and Joseph coming together. If there's not a famine, the boys don't go to Egypt. The Joseph isn't there. He doesn't come up with a plan. Everything is about the famine. What famine? Go to Amos chapter 8. You probably all know this, but 8, chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord Jehovah, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Jehovah. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of Jehovah and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, As thy God, O Dan, lives, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall, never rise up again. The famine, the famine that is coming, is not a famine of bread and water, but of hearing the words of Jehovah. And let me tell you something. People are starving to death for the word. They have their ideas, they have their, you know, but just the pure word of God, that's what people are starving for. A famine is going to drive the events uh, for the reunion. Now, you might ask yourself, are we in the time of plenty or the time of famine? Now, some might say, well, it's a time of famine. Nobody's teaching the Bible. Nobody's doing this. Nobody's doing this. You think that's true? Are we in a time of famine? Or maybe are we in a period of plenty right now? That's something you can think about this week. Now, Judah, point number four. Judah draws near to an unrecognized Joseph, not the other way around. The story doesn't have Joseph saying, hey, boys, you who That doesn't happen out of the gate. I mean, you know, people, you have to pay attention. Judah draws near to an unrecognized Joseph, and it's not the other way around. So how do we know when the prophecies are beginning to unfold and the redemption and the reunion is taking place? Watch for Judah to draw near with a special emphasis on the love of the Father. That's what I'd look for. That's what I'm looking for, okay? Uh, in fact, point number five is that the love for the Father by both is a prerequisite to the redemption. Has to be. Judah and Joseph, and neither have reached the place where their primary concern is I can't let the father down. I've pledged my, I cannot. Is my father well? And then the point number six is that it has to be perfect timing. When Yosef reveals himself. Joseph had said that when the boys brought back Benjamin, he would uh, give them their brother. They kept their word, and so did he. They brought Benjamin, and he gave them their brother. You can say on the surface it looks like he's talking about Simeon. I think that's part of it. But when Benjamin is there as the story unfolds, and he knows that they're true men, that's another key part. He knows that they're honest and upright, that's when he reveals, he gives them their brother. He gives them himself. Our reading today ends with the family of Israel together in the choicest of places in Egypt. They're taken care of by the leadership of Egypt. This family, Joseph's family, have special treatment. And 
a part that a lot of people miss, just to remind you before I close today, the Egyptian people have sold themselves into slavery. Now, do the tables turn? And this is where our story ends for today. Don't miss next week. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. Have a beautiful week. God bless you, and thanks for your time.